Welcome to Creative Labs by Alchemy, a podcast from alchemymerch.com that explores the lives of creators and their experiences bringing their art to the marketplace. Hosted by Greg Kerr. All right, welcome to Creative Labs. I'm your host, Greg, and today I'm here with Colin Frangicetto. And welcome, Colin. Hi. Yeah. Nice, buddy. Uh, it's awesome to see you. We've known each other, I was thinking about it, almost 20 years at this point. Um, yeah. And worked together in, uh, you know, thankfully, some music, a lot of art over the years and everything. And you're involved in, and always have been involved in so many different just artistic projects. And, and I really consider you at its core, an artist, you know, you're a musician, you're an artist, but in that grand overall thing, I just have always respected you in that sense that like, to me, you're what I would describe as an artist. Um, Thank you. Yeah. You know, without trying to like butter you up too much, like at its basis, uh, that's the way I look at it. I mean, and you know, with you being involved in a lot of projects, like how would you describe or like, (laughs) What are you currently into right now or actively involved in? And how do you describe your approach to art overall? <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I think that that's such a compliment, to be honest. I mean, uh, I think for a lot of my journey, you know, in, in sort of the, um, you know, like the uh, growing pains part of my journey, I would maybe get like, um, self-conscious about the fact that I do one thing or I do the other. And even at times try to like segregate the streams and, and, you know, it's like, oh, um, well, I don't want people who run an art gallery to see that my main thing is music because then maybe they'll project this thing on me. Or I don't want people that love the band to see me, um, as this, uh, you know, aspiring gallery artist or that I'm, that I'm a gallery artist and think that that music isn't my main thing or that isn't, you know, a a major passion. Um, and eventually over time, I think I just kind of grew to see it all as one thing to some extent. And that, you know, as I, um, you know, uh, I guess, got more spiritual with it and more uh, like holistic seeing like life as art and seeing that like, you know, everything can be connected and that in in essence, like I'm obsessed with trying to express my, my being and uh, that can take on a lot of different shapes. And um, because we live in, you know, a capitalistic society, I, I, I tend to like fall into these weird little tracks of trying to climb up and get all the coins and, uh, <laughs> you know, get the accolades and the different systems. And, but all in all, I, I think like, um, I think a lot of those systems are breaking down. A lot of the separations are breaking down and, um, it's more just about like, yeah, for me, I, I make music, I make visual art and then, um, I've experimented with everything in between, you know? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, one of my main things is, is playing music in a band called Circus Survive. And then I would say the majority of the rest of my time is, uh, just obsessing over expressing myself visually. Yeah. And I think that comes across, uh, you know, kind of in that sense, you described it a lot better than, than I could have. Um, but that sense of, expressing yourself expressing life and it's just a different medium you know the medium kind of you know you see ways to express yourself in that specific medium but whether that's you know i own an oil painting from you you know or Mm -hmm. uh you know in the past we've worked together commissioned artwork for t-shirts you know and whatever the different kinds of things and music and uh and all that stuff at the end of the day to me personally like my view as well is it's art it's a way of expression and the medium is just kind of like a way of showing that expression different mediums have different positive negatives things you can explore and they're totally different you know yeah and i know like you've and i'm curious too and i would imagine you know i think he said like time things are times are changing and people those lines are blurring a little bit but i think when you were getting 
when the band was kind of starting to take off and you were exploring the visual art side of painting and drawing and, and doing all those things, there was a little bit of the stigma of, are you yeah. a musician or are you an artist? And it's like, mm-hmm. are you capitalizing on, are people buying your mm-hmm. art because you're this musician? Or are they interested yeah. because of it? You know, and this kind of like, oh, do I need to separate it because I'm worried that somebody that listens to my band is going to look at my art? Like, but there was a stigma against that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, I I joke about it all the time, kind of as like, um, like a, like a, I call it like the Bo Jackson stigma, (laughs) which is like, you know, like no one took him seriously no matter what sport he played, you know? (laughs) It's kind of like, oh, this guy just wants to do everything. Um, and I think, um, I, um, yeah, I think over time I realized that really like the onus was on me to make things undeniably interesting, good, passionate, genuine, and that ultimately if people were still going to project that kind of, you know, idea onto what I was doing, then that was sort of like their bad, not mine. And, um, ultimately, yeah, I think, um, a good friend of mine, Esau Andrews, who who does like um, all the cover art for Circa and had, you know, has been like a major teacher to me, but also like um, a great friend, you know, along the way. Anytime I would sort of trip out over stuff like that, he would just be like, it's a blessing, you know, like it's not it's not a curse. It's a blessing, you know, um, you know, like the fact that you can have this different kind of, of, of fan base, um, you know, some of which, um, like your music just as much as they like your art. Um, and then also have this experience where people who love your art don't even know about your music and then find that after like to, to have that, the ability to have both of those kind of experiences is, um, is, is totally outside of the norm. And, um, it, extremely um positive <laughs> yeah so when i think good. somebody and somebody like esau is actually a good example and i'm curious i want to get to like the idea of mentors and like the importance of that but his art before you guys circa has started using it for your album covers was equally as amazing you know it yes. was, just, was fantastic but maybe not as many people had seen it and then you know as the band gets popular and the artwork was fucking amazing. Like, you know, everybody that saw it instantly was like, okay, there's something different, special about this. And then you guys, which I give the band a lot of credit for consistently like having this thematic approach and appreciating art. But I'm sure he got a bunch of new people that found out about his art because mm-hmm. of the band, you know, and, yes. and like, I'm like to try and <clears throat> credit that in any way would be, it's just not worth it. You know, like somebody that yeah. likes it, likes it. Maybe that's the initial connection point, but like, right. you know, if, if I check out a side project you do, you know, or, or something or other music or art, maybe that opens the door. But yeah. if I don't legitimately like it, I'm not going to listen to your other music just because it's you like and force right. myself to like it, you know? Um, yeah, totally. <laughs> and I think, I think for, you know, um, just to kind of like flip it on Esau, I think that, you know, I would always go back and forth with, with him saying that, no, like it, it's both a blessing and a curse. And, and then he would be like, yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> for, for, for him, um, you know, this would be something I would, I, it would sort of break my heart to witness stuff like this. And it's not like overwhelmingly like what he deals with. It's just one of the things, um, because I, I do personally feel like, um, he would have climbed the ranks uh in a major way in the visual art field no matter what if he hadn't have worked with us he would still be at the top of his game and and be very well known but i you know he he struggles at times with you know when new people find his art the connection is so strong oh. that people will see his art and literally comment circa survive oh. like just under uh, just under a painting you know yeah, and yeah, so yeah. for him it's like oh i now I can't even break this association with some people. And, and so again, you can't, you can't take out the curse and then, you know, without losing the blessing. So, so they're intricately uh, entwined and that's just part of, I think probably every artist has some aspect of, of, 
you know, you know, resentment or just like something that they're attached to that maybe is partially part of their success too, that they want to kind of like shake off or prove that, um, they're independent of that. And that's just, you know, everyone has a little bit of a chip on their shoulder to some degree, I'm sure. I guess for everything, right? Like, yeah, yeah. I think every, every bit of success does come with at least some, some little bit of that. It's funny. I just saw your coffee mug with the octopus on it, right? Yeah. It's my, in a weird mm-hmm. way. Like when I, it's, like when I think of you, I think of you almost like an octopus. That's interesting. <laughs> In a sense, because like it's like the mind, the artistic mind is like the head of it, but then like your arms are all involved in different things, but they can independently function on their own, it. but are all doing their own thing. So that's kind of kind of weird. Um, I'm deeply connected to the octopus. Oh, really? Um, well, I guess that, yes, that kind of yes. makes sense then. Um, um, I could actually <laughs> find you like hours upon hours of me talking about psychedelic synchronicities that I've had with octopus. Uh, oh, really? Oh. And uh, how <laughs> I had literally two years of my life that were practically haunted by oct- octopi synchronicities. It was so weird. But um, yeah, so it's awesome to just hear that association makes sense in some other completely um, different, um, yeah, like angle. Uh, you know, I never really thought about myself in that way, but that does make sense. Um, and uh, I feel a kinship towards that that creature. So, and I'm cool. not like extreme. You know, anybody don't get mad at me. I'm not incredibly educated up on the way like octopi work, but you know, I mean, yeah. I, everything I was saying that each arm kind of can independently work, but yeah, oh yeah. That's, they can that's, do some incredible stuff. <laughs> so that's kind of random and and weird there. Um, <laughs> like with with Esau, you know, because I know I've been like following along your art career for a long time personally. Um, even yeah. all the way back to I think we did like a uh, a charity shirt with Miles to go with the piano teeth. Uh, yeah. Or I mean, I that I think that might have been like 2010 or I twenty two. I don't know. It's been a yeah. long, long yeah. time. Um, yeah. But has he served kind of in a sense of like a mentor or do you feel like you've had any, any mentors along the way with during your art career or anybody that you've looked up to or kind of had that sounding board? He's definitely the closest to it. I think, um, you know, as far as consistent and, and all throughout, he's been someone, I think, especially um, early on when I was trying to navigate you know, galleries and, and doing shows and, and that kind of stuff. Um, he really served as like a, a sounding board and, and someone who um, could point me in the direction. Uh, like if I felt lost or defeated, he, he always like had a pretty like grounded way of looking at things. And, um, and he was always really supportive of just like my journey and like, my growth and experimentation. And then of course, like with technical questions, I could always hit him up about stuff too. Um, you know, he works mostly in oil. I, I worked mostly in acrylic, but there was some overlap. And then he would like, he would really, um, always have like something for me to chew on for a while to think about. Um, and it was never like, Oh, you suck at doing this. It was always like, (laughs) you know what, you know, what really helped me? Like I would just like, you know, he would just give me some example about how he, you know, would focus on life drawing for a while, or he would like get really into um, changing up perspective in in his paintings and stuff like that. And just things that would stick in my head and serve as little like lighthouses along the way, you know? Well, I think it's interesting too, you know, as somebody that's followed your work for a long time, also seeing these different elements start to kind of like creep themselves into your work and then yep. get floored and developed. And then you maybe move on a little bit over this, you know, it's basically yeah. just like a constant progression, but at the same point of like, whatever's kind of turning you on it at the time, you know, yeah. like, oh, I'm interested in adding in these geometric shapes and these things or uh, flowers or, you know, or the animals, that, the painting that we have is like a two headed cow with all these flowers, you know, and all this stuff. Um, and seeing just like, you know, all the directions it takes you in, but at its core, it's like, you're just exploring whatever's hitting you at the the time, you know? Um, and you've always been, at least in my view, like really open to different mediums, you know? Um, and I know, you've been into digital arts as well. And I think we have probably a very similar view of it, that it is art, like it's just a 
you know, different <laughs> media, like it's, it's uh-huh. equal expression and things like that. And, you know, the other day you said to me, you know, I was asking about NFTs and, you know, you basically said like NFTs changed my life full stop. Yep. Um, and I think, you know, there's so much kind of just negativity floating around from angles, you know, of uh, different things. And I think mostly from people that aren't professional artists, um, yeah. in your world of who you interact with mostly and who we interact with and I interact with mostly on a daily basis are artists, you know, yeah. that, that can potentially see the positives and, you know, looking at what you've been doing, it just, to me, it looks like a natural extension of anything else that you've done prior. Like, I don't see any kind of disconnect or it's just like, oh yeah. Well, okay. That makes sense. Colin's making NFTs, you know, um, yeah. mm-hmm. there's a, a digital painting, but like, it's just, it still looks like your work there, you know, there's different elements yeah. of incorporating the, the, the medium specifically, but, um, yeah. so I want to ask you like, what kind of got you even initially interested in it <coughs> conceptually, you know, and then what's kind of pushed you into, t- you know, making your own to sell and stuff. Yeah. Um, well, so I, I got interested in crypto, I think probably back in like 2016 ish. And, um, there was something about it that was, um, really like nagging at me. And, uh, it was like, okay, this is cool. You know, you know, you buy some, it goes up. That's cool. (laughs) You know? Um, but there was something more to it that was, um, that was interesting to me and I couldn't quite put my finger on it at first. And then towards the end of that really big, that first really big Bitcoin cycle, um, where it went up to 20 K and like, then there was like this big wipeout and sort of like the, the market kind of like crashed. Uh, and, uh, you saw a ton of people leave that, that space and, they were just like, oh, you know, like this is this is just like a, a scam or whatever. And like right in the middle of all of that is when um, you know CryptoPunks started, and a, a few other really uh, just interesting projects would pop up. And and I was just like, what the fuck is a digital collectible? Like that is so interesting to me. Uh, this idea of like digital scarcity uh, was really fascinating to me. Um, I think. Mostly because um, already at, at that time I had been, you know, highly exposed to a lot of digital artists and and a lot of people who, you know, I just encountered even just like going through the gallery system and like being pretty immersed in fine art um, for most of my adult life. You know, even just going to museums and seeing these like video artists or just pe- light artists, like people that were making things that seemed really difficult uh to monetize um these art forms that i'm like oh well i guess you have to like get a grant or (laughs) you know like i don't know what like how that works um but eventually you know i met i had met a lot of people that worked in those spaces and uh, a lot of people who were doing really interesting digital art like the glitch movement was really um inspiring to me seeing that you know just being on Tumblr all the time and seeing just all this stuff blowing my mind constantly and seeing how uh, a lot of these artists were changing the face of culture um, through, through these mediums and not really necessarily being compensated or even existing in the physical realm, which is really fascinating to me. And as a avid psychedelic user, it really, I think, you know, it, it it really got its uh to stay on the octopi thing that is tentacles in my brain you know like i really was just like constantly thinking about you know for lack of a better term like the metaverse and like um the way that art was going to be evolving because i'm i'm often like projecting you know into the future also like a major sci-fi nerd and stuff so um I think having seen what like social media, like how social media popped up so quickly and then changed the face of our existence so quickly, I think naturally I was thinking about the ways that technology and digital artwork um, would be changing our lives over the next, you know, few decades. And so when I saw CryptoPunks pop up and then there was another um, project, um, 
they're called, they're called Dada. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember the rest of it, but basically, I found they were like a um, like a crypto art uh, collaborative project where basically people would get a membership to this website totally free and do these collaborative digital drawings. And then eventually those things got minted and um, were available super cheap or you got them like basically for free. Right. Like so much of the crypto art movement started as basically free. You yeah, know, it was like, hey, I wave free. my hand, I'm into it. And it, here you yeah. go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, one of the biggest uh, crypto artists in existence, X Copy, um, was basically giving away his work for years. And now it goes for like multiple millions. But like... Um, so much of this stuff like in the in the beginning was like extremely experimental extremely punk and i think that's probably why it appealed to me <laughs> um it just seems so bizarre and and uh and cool and and also like almost like um a perfect like countercultural vein you know uh which i'm always intrigued by you know i'm uh, obsessed with zine culture and right. punk and hardcore and all these things. Uh, so this just felt like right in line. Um, and so, um, you know, Sarah and I, one night, I remember we were like, we were like really high and like, we were like thinking about um, adopting like a crypto punk family. We were like, we we're like, <laughs> Oh, we should make a little crypto punk family. If only we actually followed through with that. Uh, we got distracted. We got distracted by crypto kitties. <laughs> got a couple of cri crypto kitties, which are worthless. Crypto punks are like, you know, a couple million now. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, I just was like, I, I overall just thought it was really cool and fascinating. This idea of attaching an image to like a contract on the blockchain um, and how, you know, I think at the time there was a lot of um, pretty famous like art fraud cases kind of like populating the news and it just immediately, you know, kind of the dots connected in my brain. I'm like, oh, this is going to be a big deal. Like eventually this is going to be a thing for art provenance, um, not just digital art, but I think this is eventually going to be a thing. Um, and um, at the time there was no super rare yet. There was no platform. There was no easy way to make, um, you know, a quote unquote NFT. That wasn't even a term yet. Um, these were different types of Ethereum tokens that were that were happening. And I, I was just paying attention to it. I was just looking at it. All of that dopamine and kind of interest in crypto shifted over to the, the art side of things. And I just started watching and observing and thinking about how maybe I could get involved. Um, but at the time, I was mostly, you know, I made digital art, but in my mind, it didn't look anything like my physical art that I was making. It didn't look like my paintings. It didn't really look like um, sort of in my mind, like the universe that I had been created, uh, being, been creating. Um, so I thought my digital art would freak people out and <laughs> they wouldn't be into it. And, you know, along the way, I would, I would share little things on Instagram here and there. Um, and then, you know, I'm really into like, experimental video art and stuff right. like that and text art and and things like that um and you can go through my feed and find little bits of it popping up here and there um but i didn't feel confident enough uh, when i finally did see super rare pop up um and then started seeing like oh this is becoming a thing i didn't feel like i belonged um at first and so i just sort of like i, I I guess I would say I was scared off at first and just felt like I, there wasn't a place for me yet. Um, because of the art or were there technology aspects? Like, um, you know, because I think a lot of people are scared right now still if they're not involved in crypto, which P.S., you were like telling me outside the marquee in Phoenix in like 2016, you should get into crypto. Yeah. My fault for that. <laughs> um, but, but, um, you know, like, but a lot of people I think are scared of the tech. And I was listening to somebody the other day that was like, you know, we're still at that point where it's, it's hard because you have to explain to somebody the tech first. Yeah. And then about how there's some value there, which most of the things we use on a daily basis now that we're so used to, you don't have to lead with the tech. I couldn't tell you the first thing, how email works. Right. You know, yeah. or how my telephone works. We're literally exactly. doing that. I'm just used to it. So I, I go into Someone it. Someone made it really easy for us. Yeah. yeah. First. 
And so, uh, you know, w- was there a little bit of like tech stuff or was it mostly just thinking like, you know, because I don't want to say you're like developing a brand, but your art maybe had a certain vibe and you felt that your digital art wasn't falling into that quote unquote brand sort of established. That was the main sense. thing. I think, um, I think, I think it was, uh, for one, it, it really wasn't the tech because, uh, after spending a couple of years figuring how to make a digital wallet for every bizarre, obscure <laughs> cryptocurrency that I right. tinkered with, I was like, okay, I can figure out how to mint this. Uh, but it wasn't really about that. It was mostly, it was mostly the fear that what I was making wasn't really in line. It like, you know, my OCD sort of took over. It was like, Oh, well, how is this going to fit in? And then how am I going to explain to people like what this is and blah, blah, blah. And I was just like, eh, like I'll wait, I'll just wait. And, um, I think, um, also you only have so many hours in the day. You only have so much energy and, I was still just pouring so much time into my paintings and my drawings and and then the band, which is also a full-time job. <clears throat> so I think, you know, I was just like all full up on obsessions at the time <laughs> and just had had enough going on, um, but kept watching, kept watching. And then um, I think it was probably a little over, it's probably about two years ago that I started getting serious about it. I was like, okay, I'm going to start just slowly. I didn't feel like any major rush. I was just like, I'm going to start creating a body of digital work um, in, in hopes that eventually this will be a good use for it. And if not, it'll be great experiment. Um, And, uh, and I think in general, all of my paintings, my physical paintings and drawings usually start in a digital place where I'm hmm. doing mock-ups and stuff in Photoshop. Oh, and, okay. and so I'm just always in there anyway. Uh, so it's just kind of like, all right, I'll just add a little like daily exercise of making some digital work. Um, and so then uh, I, I met my friend, Sarah Zucker, who, uh, is known as the Sarah show um, super accomplished digital artist who um, uses a lot of like sort of like retro technologies to make her work and you know has like over like 10 billion downloads on Giphy like has created she didn't get paid mil- for <laughs> no uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, and has created you know um, you know probably millions of downloads of like Instagram filters and stickers and all these things. Uh, what was it was sort of like an OG Tumblr artist. And, um, so befriending her, learning more about her, her journey in art. And then like all the, all the ways that, you know, she had to sort of like jump through hoops to monetize her work, um, over the years, seeing her jump in to NFTs, um, she was one of like, she's considered like an OG, um, you know, crypto artist at this point. I mean, she got in, I think at like 2019, but, uh, yeah. uh, but that's like, but that's far enough back. And she was early enough that that really, um, you know, she sticks out in the herd. And um, I saw her, there were like multiple pieces that she minted that were just like really um, kind of like stopped me in my tracks because she was making these gifts that to me felt like objects. You know, it's like I'm watching this seamless, uh, perfect loop that she meticulously created. Um, and it was hitting me like I was seeing a painting in a museum, you know, it's like, I was just absolutely hypnotized by this work and then feeling like this sense of like this, uh, this thinginess, you know, it's not just a, it's not just like this, uh, uh, combination of data that I'm looking at on a screen. Like I'm seeing and feeling this sense of like spirit in the same way that I would feel that when I look at a drawing or a sculpture or whatever. Uh, and then seeing her find collectors for that work and just see her, you know, trajectory early on was really inspiring to me. And I had a couple conversations with her, where she just encouraged me and just said, you know, you should just get in there and just play around and see what happens. And um, then eventually, probably about a year ago, I minted my first piece on Known Origin. Um, and 
the first. Can you describe kind of people that might not know just a basic of what known origin is or like, yeah. Why? So it's a platform. Yeah. It's a, it's a curated uh, NFT platform and it's uh, it runs on Ethereum and it's a, um, they're kind of like, they were one of the, one of the first, I would say like they were a little bit after super rare, I think, but um, they're, you know, they are, uh, Definitely like a cool platform that it, you know, I really liked the different creators on there and they had a, a certain vibe that felt uh, like it fit the aesthetic of, of my work. And so I submitted, got, got my application accepted and I was like, okay, now I got to figure out what I'm going <laughs> to do. And uh, I decided, I think early on, I was still in this place where I was toiling a lot with like, how do I bridge, you know, my my fine art career um, up until now into this stuff. And so my first experiment was I took one of my, uh, I took a scan of a physical painting that I made and then um, animated it and kind of like just made it breathe and move and made some, you know, stripped it down to layers and then moved it around and various uh, video um, applications. And, and then I scored it you know, I made this, um, ambient score for it. Is that the um, listener? It's probably, yes. Oh, I know. Yes. I was like, I want to buy this from him, but it's not for sale. And it's somebody has it, but uh, I totally saw that. I was going to ask you about the listener because conceptually that was one of your like earlier. That was my very first. Yeah. Okay. Cause that's um, a, like, that's a really, I, I wanted to ask you about that one. Not even realizing it was your first because there's a bunch of stuff compacted into it, you know, like it's not just, mm-hmm. I don't want to say just necessarily, but it's not mm-hmm. only the video component. You also said like the owner of this gets access to this, what, 30 minute kind of yep. piece of music. Right. Um, yeah. So, and, and I guess the one thing too, with like known origin, obviously their name kind of has a certain implication of like, right. You know where this came from, right. This artist is very mm-hmm. of a sign of verification. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And coming from the gallery space or coming from a more traditional kind of art space, uh, you know, physical merch, you know, all these things, were you drawn to that idea that, Hey, this is, was there anything about that? That was like, this is sort of like a digital gallery. There's uh, a verification in a sense that this is Colin, this is his creation or just kind of, that's what you, you know? Um, I think I'm sure that that maybe um, subconsciously played a role in it. Like the fact that it was curated and that they seemed like they had their shit together and it seemed legit, you know, like going to the platform was a interesting sort of gallery like experience. And that, um, yeah, that there was aspects of that for sure. Um, but I think, yeah, I, I, I think that definitely played a role. Um, like that familiarity, I think, you know, like feeling yeah, I think also the system, you know, yeah, for sure. I think they were, they had a lot of artists that I respected as well who, okay. um, you know, so, so that was one, um, I had, you know, there was definitely options to, you know, just mint it on open sea or wherever else. Um, there, there definitely are open, open minting options, but at the time I felt like, um, yeah, I had applied to a few places and, and known origin was the first one to say yes. And I was like, Oh, I really like, I like their vibe anyway. So I'm going to go here. Um, and it just felt right. Um, yeah. So what made so, you do so, something that was so complex is like, you know, this, uh, you know, they're <laughs> like, Hey, uh, you know, like the owner of this gets like basically this piece of music that I wrote, you know, like for meant for, you know, whatever, like uh psychedelic use or meditation or artistic yeah. post dates or, you know, I mean, I, as a first NFT, you know, I don't want to say you're like overachieving a little bit here, but like it, it was kind of going beyond. It felt, you know? <laughs> yeah. It felt, it felt important to me. Well, for, for one, I wanted to use what I felt like was uh, a major positive of, of the medium, which is that you can pull different disciplines together and use it as one thing. So like, um, 
you know, that kind of like circles back to where we started where, where, you know, this feeling of like separating my music from my art and all this stuff. This would be the first time I was really putting them together and hmm. monetizing them together. Um, but also I felt like I still had that old school mentality resistance to the idea that like, well, what am I selling here? Am I just right. selling like, uh, you know, am I just selling like a, a contract? Like what right. am I selling here? Um, Cause I was so used to, okay, you, you give me money. I give you something. You right. get this thing that you get to hold <laughs> a physical um, bartering system to some, to yeah. some degree. I mean, you know, obviously like music is an outlier. Like we've right. been selling digital music forever um you know or at least for a decade and and it's like i still couldn't wrap my head around the idea that someone would just want to pay for the digital work itself and that's it um at that point i was not ready to jump fully into that pool yet uh, and I think so psychologically there's also like artists like you were talking about um your friend that does digital art and the jiffy and these different things and these instagram filters yeah. You're not getting paid. Like there, there's been a psychological, like an undervaluation of digital art for a long time, and I think that's been built into this kind of psyche. You know, these ideas of Fiverr. You know, in places like yep. sure. You know, it, look, my view is if somebody says, "Look, I'll make that for five bucks," hire them. They're choosing to do that. That's their choice. But yep. there's been, you know, we talk about logo development or you know. Um, Whatever, there's been a de an undervaluation, I think, in general of art and especially digital art. Um, yes. That I could see that idea of, well, shit, is somebody going to pay for this? You know, and why maybe even original NFTs like the CryptoPunks, it was like, oh, hey, I know about this. I'm interested. Here's one for free. I wonder if there was a little bit of that kind of coming in, like, or can we actually charge for this, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, for sure. I, I think like I wasn't, I didn't have the confidence yet or the, you know, I also hadn't, I think I had maybe just made my own first NFT purchase, like not that long prior to that and was still wrapping my head around just like the actual feeling of what that's like to collect and, and feeling confident enough that if I just put a piece of digital art out there that it's worth collecting. Um, and and for myself, not really being known as a digital artist, uh, I didn't want to feel like I was like a poser either, you know? So <laughs> I felt like, genius, uh, you know, yes, exactly. Yeah. No, right. I mean, there is so much cash grabbing that, you right. know, I felt like I really wanted to get it across that this was something that um, I was passionate about and that I was, I was genuinely there for the experiment and for, um, yeah, to, to make something novel and, and cool and, and to give whoever was going to like put this first sign of faith out there, Roger, thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, um, that they would, they should be rewarded for it. And I wanted to give them this thing that they would have the keys to, you know, Hey, you're going to get this piece of music. No one else is going to hear it in full unless you want them to. Yeah, I'm You want to put this on the right internet? Now. Go ahead. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, if you, if you want to put this out there for people, that's fine. I'm giving you full ownership of it. So can we and, can we touch on that for a second? I mean, so you, yeah. I mean, I know in the description of it, it basically says like you gain access to this thing, but if Roger, um, who's just been doxxed, um, yeah. you know, decides <laughs> that he wants to put this piece of music out publicly as an artist, as the creator, um, you know, and and I think the amount that was paid for it doesn't make a difference, right? That conceptually, you you did this thing, somebody purchased it. You, yeah, you kind of, did you put that in initially into it saying like, you are the, you are the owner of this or you have any kind of rights or, you know, because that's something that comes up that as a complaint, like, what do I own? I own a token representing X, Y, Z, right? So if he wants right. to share that music on, I don't, you know, wherever, um, you are, you've kind of given those rights saying like, you own this. Yep. And that's it. Okay. Full, full rights. Um, and that's something to be negotiated for every single artist and every single piece. You know what I mean? There, there are artists out there who, um, like there's been some really interesting experiments musically with artists putting out, um, a full song and then, and say literally putting in the NFT, like full commercial rights go with this, 
you know, and, yeah. and they sold, and they sold that. For, I mean, I forget which artist it was, but it was pretty ridiculous. They, they sold it for like a couple hundred thousand bucks and, um, pretty interesting. Um, it depends. I mean, you know, what is, um, I don't know what the top like circus song on Spotify is maybe, I don't know, get out or something, you know, whatever, like yeah. what is get out worth? Right. Like, right. I, I don't know in terms of plays, I don't know enough. I'm not a musician that makes money, you know, off of anything. So I don't know what that would be worth, but to somebody that legitimately could have a, could be like worth putting a couple hundred thousand dollars into, you know, like for sure, movies. man. Yeah. I mean, like, if it's a well-known artist or even an artist who's up and coming and emerging and has something that's really special, I mean, what a lot of people don't realize is how many offers we turn down. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, oh yeah. Like there's a lot of uh, offers over the years of like, oh, we'd like to use this or we'd like to use that or, you know, come do this, come do that. And, you, you know, like you, you as the artist make the decision of does that fit in with our legacy does that fit in with what we want to do and you know i i don't ever foresee circa putting ourselves in that kind of position where we would give someone else like you know that kind of control over right. our stuff but it's certainly revolutionary to be able to do that and yeah. um i think it's uh it's fascinating and interesting um but for me it's like I felt really confident that there wasn't too much somebody could do to this 30 minute ambient piece that I made that it's extremely <laughs> anti-commercial. <laughs> like not, there's nothing. It's like a John this is not gonna, piece. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is not, this is not winding up on a beer commercial. Um, right, okay. I mean, unless it's a really cool beer, I mean, <laughs> um, you know, um, but like I just had, I just had faith and just felt like, the right person's going to find this and, um, and it's going to be special and, and, and it'll be cool. And, and if they don't, they don't, but like, um, I, I feel like they did. And, uh, it was, it was really cool. It was a really, um, it was a fun, cool first experiment. Um, yeah, and I still feel pretty crazy, proud of it. It's yeah. definitely, you know what I mean? Like it's definitely an ambitious one. It doesn't surprise me, but it's just kind of like, well, let me put it, let me add value. And so when you're talking about it, thinking like, because you come from these other spaces, almost like, Am I not offering enough up? I need, let me package right. this. Um, yeah. You know, let me, let me give you the VIP merch bundle experience um, kind of thing. And it's like, it, well, here's all this extra stuff I'm providing value. Look, look you know, um, and somebody right away was like, yep, uh, yep. I recognize that as being valuable. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. So I noticed you, I, I believe I may be wrong, but you've been primarily using like Tezos for, yeah. Tezos, I don't know how to pronounce this stuff. Um, yep. So what made you, and I, and I do notice there seem to be a lot of kind of indie artists that are using that and, you know, what made you go in that direction for your, for your work initially? And what was that process? Like, if you've got a new piece, the digital part, the file part is done. What's kind of your process or what has been your process? You know, if somebody's interested in how to do it, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, well, so, um, I put a few other works out on Ethereum as I was just getting started. Like I, I did a piece on foundation. Um, I, I was accepted as an artist there pretty early on and that, that felt really cool. And I really loved the piece that I did there. Um, but then uh, I did a real small edition. I did a couple small editions on uh, through Bitsky as well, which are, they're kind of more like a, almost like a, big cartel of NFTs, okay. like where you can set up your own storefront and it's really interesting. And, hmm. um, anyway, like I think I started getting overwhelmed at that point by the hype. Uh, there was like really like a surge of attention that all happened like right, maybe like a month or two after I got into it, like after I was like, uh, minting all of a sudden, like it was all anyone was talking about and it was it was out there uh you know not my work but like just the, <laughs> f f not the f phenomenon you know itself yeah. and um and then uh with ethereum um you know there's a lot of concerns about the energy usage which i think um a lot of it is pretty misunderstood but i think like there's a valid there's always a 
valid reason to be conscious of energy consumption. And um, so that was one part, but I think also another big part for a lot of indie artists is the cost of, of minting on Ethereum is can be really high. And so that combined with the fact that Ethereum had, had at least at that time, felt like big money was pouring into it and like just the profile of the whole space was really like exploding and it felt too much to me like it it felt like um every piece was just you know i was just overthinking it and like just it was it felt so daunting to you know go through uh because there's a thing like when you mint something like it's there's no edit button right? right so 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 like if you fuck something up in the description or there's a little like um problem with the image or whatever you notice the only way to actually fix that is to burn the token and do it again if it's already purchased you know game game over yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> you know you'd have to either like arrange that with the person and remand and anyway it's like there's a lot of stress like if you if you were <laughs> if you were like a not neurotypical as uh, I am not, um, it, it, you know, it's stressful, um, to get it right. Um, so the fact and that if it's costing you that much money at the yeah. time, you know, let's say pre lazy minting or things like that. And you're like, Hey, this yeah. is going to cost me 60 bucks. Right. Uh, there goes nothing more. Yeah. Try, try more like 300, 300 like, you, you know, know. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and some days it was like, uh, my first thing with known origin, my file got fucked up and it got sort of like stuck in this weird place where I couldn't see it on mobile. Okay. And, uh, so I had to burn it and redo it. And, and because it was a, a, a it was like part of one of their curated drops, it had to be done by a certain time. And I wound up like spending like almost $900, like, oh. you know, uh, through it. Luckily they were really cool. And because it was basically their fault, like they yeah. covered the gas for, for the fuck oh, up, man. but like, <laughs> but dude, like, you know, a, a normal artist couldn't hang with that. I mean, like yeah. that's just yeah. like a major thing just to put out one piece. I mean, right. yeah. imagine if I had to like cough up $900 every time I made a pain, painting, it's just not sustainable, but, um, well, there, but there is a little bit like when you, and I apologize for diverting a little bit, but like when you decide you make a painting, you have to buy materials, right? You, uh, if of you want to do a, you know, 48 by 24 canvas, you got to buy the canvas, you got to buy the yep. paints, you got to buy the brushes. There's some, yep. there's some built-in costs, which it's like, uh, I want to say pay to play a little bit, but there you're, you're putting that upfront investment into what you're doing. Um, of course. which when you're yeah. minting and on a digital work, like, and nine heart dollars, totally insane. You know, yeah. um, but there is a, a little bit, I think is okay. Yeah. A little bit is, is like, you know, cause I look at lazy minting as like, it just red bubbled everything, um, right. yep. to a certain extent. But, um, so you go through that process and you're like, okay, Ethereum's kind of priced out for what I'm looking to do right now when, you know, when yeah. you're deciding. I think it also was, um, it just felt like, okay, like I, I still, Whereas I don't fully agree with the the uh, the whole energy argument with with Ethereum, I do always want to be conscious of it. The same way that if I can walk somewhere rather than drive my car, I'm going to do that too. Um, right. And so, for me, feeling like I was still in a very experimental phase uh, with NFTs, like I just felt like, um, you know, okay, like I'm going to back off this for now. Um, you know. Obviously, there's a lot of changes happening with Ethereum too. So I was like, just kind of like, okay, well, maybe I'll just chill until it goes proof of stake or whatever. Then all of a sudden, I I kind of stumble down the rabbit hole and find <laughs> Hikik Nunk, which is like this insanely minimalistic, like very like, um, I don't even know what to call it. Like, you know, uh, just very punk, like bizarre uh, platform that has no curation process anyone can can mint there and it's on it runs on tezos which is proof of stake completely energetically um sound you know like to mint to mint a piece on tezos is like uh cheaper uh energy wise than like sending a tweet you know right. it's like literally like nothing it's um so i like find this platform 
And I realized like, oh my God, like not only is this kind of like everything that I've been looking for, like as far as like the types of artists I was finding just by looking at the live feed was just <laughs> fucking mind blowing, you know, like, um, you know, there were like OG, like uh, a GIF artist there who I knew their work from Tumblr, like a decade plus. <laughs> like, so there was like, there was like history there, you know, already happening. And then I um, stumbled across this person who had made like the first NFT game essentially on, on Tezos on, on this platform where, you know, essentially the thing was like changing as you mm. tapped it on the screen. And it was this thing that you could buy for like, I think like half a Tezos, which like, oh, at the time was like $2, <laughs> yeah. you know what I mean? Um, but like, but like people were minting like mul multiple editions of this stuff on there. And, um, and then I started noticing that like the artists who were using it were like really communicating a lot with each other on, on Twitter. Like there was definitely like a community that was like very, very strong already. Um, and this was like, pre 10,000 objects on Hick Hick and Nunk, which um, oh, wow. okay. has kind of has kind of developed a, a major like like kind of like legend status now um but like um you know like this was a uh, this was very early on and i was like well i want to get involved in this and then when i actually bought some tezos from coinbase just a very small amount um and sent it over there i was like ready i was ready to like to pay because i was like oh well, i was like what is, i wonder what this costs i mean they're selling their work for so cheap like i don't know how this is all going down and i go over there and like it costs like a fraction of a tez to to, to mint and i was just like kind of like mind blown like oh my god um so i think my first tezos purchase was probably like i don't know like two hundred dollars and i've never bought it since you know like, um, <laughs> and, you and, know, I, and i have stuff on there right i I mean, my collection on there is insane. Uh, it's really insane. Um, I, I own a few hundred pieces, uh, and um, and some of them are worth quite a lot of money at this point. Um, it's pretty gnarly. Um, but I mean, anyway, I, I made a decision early on. Like, I'm never going to cash out. I'm going to use everything that I that I gain here from my work to buy other artist stuff. Hmm, okay, and. Um, eventually eventually that changed uh after i started my uh my adhd thing but like it was like at, for the first i don't know however many months i mean every single test that i earned i, I put back into other artists um because there was just not out of like the good of my heart even it was just like so much good stuff that i got obsessed with collecting and that's where i really truly started understanding like yeah. I'm not getting any physical component from any of this stuff, but like I, tr this truly is giving me the same exact feeling I feel when I collect a drawing or a painting from somebody and I'm looking at it on my wall, it's getting the same exact feeling. Um, so I totally, it all clicked and I started making a lot of experimental work on there, um, and finding my people and, um, and then slowly, but surely as I was really leaning more and more into like purely digitally native stuff like nothing you know i made some things on that first account that were like sort of like oh i'd take a drawing and then sort of animate it or whatever um or i'd make a little painting bring it in fuck with, with it, blah, blah, blah. it. <laughs> um yeah um and uh but then eventually it was like I was making purely digital work that only existed in the digital realm. And I started um, kind of like honing in on, on this style that was kind of combining a lot of like my kind of like early obsession with graffiti when I first, you know, kind of got into punk and hardcore. I was into graffiti as well. And then um, combining that with like a love for I, I guess like glitch and um, psychedelics really. I mean, I mean that that's kind of like the style of, of ADHD, which is just like, well, I guess abstract expressionism too. Like the, those, those things all combined, um, but all digitally native. And 
Um, so yeah, after finding a little bit of success and finding some collectors there, I decided to start a, a new wallet um, and just dub it ADHD, no Colin Circa really. You know, it just says like Ox Colin Circa or whatever. <laughs> um, this was before object.com had had launched their collections feature. Um, oh, so okay. there was no way, there was no way where on Hickhack Nunk you could create separate collections that to have like different vibes or anything like that. It was like okay. just one big, huge like stream of, you know, it's like your Instagram account, you know? Yeah. It's um, very punk rock zine looking yeah. on that site, you know? And, and so yeah. basically you were do until like object came along or something, you know, there was no way for you to like collect or to, uh, to separate collections. Is, Curate. Yeah. Is the idea to, was there a little bit of, because you're using this primarily digital medium that this new work ADHD is coming from, was there a little bit of that? Like, I, I want to separate it intentionally because of, again, like we talked about earlier, do you think a little bit of that wanting to break or I want people to get into this because of, on its own merit and not like, again, breaking free of the things that have, you know, put you in the spotlight yes. in some senses. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think, to some degree, I think the the biggest inclination was definitely to focus and curate a series that had a vibe and did not break from it, right? Okay. Uh, I really wanted to do that. I also wanted to do a series that was all one of ones. So okay. so so there was already that inclination of like, all right, I want to do something different. But then it occurred to me as I was like struggling to figure out like, well, am I going to call this column circuit two or what am I going <laughs> to call this wallet? You know, um, I'm sitting there and then I got like distracted like 20 times just while I was in the middle of that. <laughs> and I was just like, fuck, you know? And like, it just like popped out. Like I just like typed it ADHD, you know? And I was yeah. just like, dude, like there's been no other more significant guiding light in my art <laughs> career than my own ADHD. And, um, you know, so it felt right. And I was just like, you know, one of the big pluses I think of, of crypto art is that, you know, there's a huge amount of anonymous artists out there and, uh, at, at a minimum, like pseudo anonymous. And so it felt right. It felt like, um, using the medium properly. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, I just decided it was just an experiment. You know, at first I just said, I'm going to just do a, a series of one ones um, that are all in, in this style. And um, to my surprise, you know, I, 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 you know, I priced them super modestly, just like 50 Tez um, for one of one. I think that that's a, a pretty great deal. And, and at the time of when you were doing that, that was maybe two, 300, something around yeah, uh, yeah, equivalent maybe, at the time. Maybe, a, maybe, a, yeah, something like that. Maybe even okay. less. Um, and, um, and yeah, so to my surprise, they sold right away when I, I put hmm. up the first two. Um, and then I dropped the next one and, and noticed that it, uh, it was like instant, you know, hmm. like, someone had sniped it, you know? Um, and then I just was like, all right, I'm going to keep going with this. Like, and I just kind of made it at my leisure at first I was making them. Um, I mean, I still am, but like, I definitely picked up the rhythm at a certain point like, whoa, like this is getting crazy. Like <laughs> as I like broke the, like, you know, 10 to 15 pieces in a row feeling like momentum was building and pe people were really paying attention. And like, I hadn't started the, the, the new Twitter yet. I, I really was just like, they were just getting picked up. You know, people were seeing them on the live feed and just picking them up. Oh, and, that's crazy. Um, Cause I mean, the crypto yeah. Twitter is sort of its own separate in a sense, like a Avenue of exposure, promotion. you know, yeah. promotion that it's pretty hard. Yeah. It's pretty hard to exist without it, unless you really have like some, some magnetism happening, you know? Um, yeah. yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, I eventually shifted over and made another Twitter for for that um, and just saw it as like, all right, like, you know, the way that algorithms are working now, like the people that follow Colin Circa, like 
they don't want to see this shit. Like they don't care. Like, <laughs> right. like, like some of them do, but they'll, yeah. they'll come along. And, and the other ones, like, all I'm going to do is just get tossed into some weird black hole where nobody sees my shit because the people that follow me normally, like, just don't care about this. So I thought it'd be better to have more care because of it being art as opposed to music or because there's been a lot of people that have like followed or gotten both. into your art because that, or because of it being an NFT specifically like that. They both, might not, uh, yeah. Yeah. A little bit of both. I think like okay. I already struggle to get, um, you know, consistent attention uh, to either or, <laughs> you okay. know what I mean? Like, yeah. like, like um, and mu- music as well, like music and art because of, you know, as my art profile has risen over the years, like my followers have gotten more and more diverse as far as do Mm. people follow me for my art or for my music. Right. Right. And, um, so, and that makes me like enemy number one to an algorithm. (laughs) It's just like, we can't figure out who actually wants to see this. Um, you know, um, it's like, my my patrons on Patreon, they want to see all of it. They love it. Right, right, um, right. But they're direct. But they've op- they've opted that, in. Yeah, they're supporting you sp- directly, intentionally. They like it all. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, but so, so yeah, I just started this separate Twitter thing for it. And I, I, in my mind, it was like, I'd rather have 100 people who definitely want to see this series and what this, you know, this vibe than like 100 people you know, in my 13,000 followers or whatever, like maybe like a fraction of them see it, or maybe it doesn't even find them, you know? Uh, So anyway, yeah, it just started picking up its own sort of like life. And, um, and I got more and more inspired by the work and working digitally and abstractly specifically, I think, Um, you know, starting as an abstract painter who, felt like I couldn't be one, you know, basically <laughs> felt like, oh, well, I'm never going to be taken seriously as an abstract painter because I don't have an art degree. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, I think kind of like incorrectly assume that abstract painters like can't paint for real, you know, like, like <sighs> oh, 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 like they can't, they could never like paint an animal, <laughs> you know, like right. that's You're why like, they do that. Something like Rothko, it's like I, that argument, it's like, A, if you ever actually stood in front of a Rothko, we talked about the energy or the feeling. Yeah. I'm using that as an example, Polly. You know, there's yeah. tons of different people, but, and then if you actually looked at you're like, oh, okay, well, this guy was like an art teacher. You know, it was like, the, the had this career before, whatever, like not understanding. And I think that's, it's annoying that you got to hear that stuff, but anybody that's like, legitimately into artistic expression right i think knows what's up understands yeah. that like oh yeah, yeah. i mean and, and <laughs> even i should have put like paint for real in quotations because you know I mean? <laughs> like to me to me like um yeah like i mean i uh, i would probably take a joan mitchell over a dolly like any day you know right. that's just like that. and that's always been the case um even though i went through many years of being mostly a figurative painter. Um, you know, I think for some reason in the beginning, because I didn't have, I didn't necessarily have the ability to paint super realistic things or anything like that. I was a decent painter, but like, I felt like I, you know, my insecurity pushed me out of abstract work initially into figurative, basically to prove that I could do it first, you know? (laughs) Right, Right. Um, and so we did the bowl of fruit because that's what we were. Well, you know, at least probably when we were going through school, it's like you, that's what you had to do, you know? Yeah. So after doing that for a decade plus now, I felt like I had earned my stripes and like, you know, just felt like, fuck it. Like I right now, the world is so weird. <laughs> um, existing right now is so strange and complicated and i don't i don't necessarily feel completely satisfied by painting um you know a skull or whatever it is you know that whatever image that i'm trying to convey um you know a meaning through it's just not doing it for me right now so like uh abstraction sucked me back in and has given me 
the ability to, I think, speak more complexly and and with more depth um, than I am able to currently with forms, you know, with like with like objective forms, and and it's just felt more satisfying, you know. Um, so that's just where I'm at right now. Um, I still actually have this. I have this series of. Um, of like figurative digital works that I've been working on for a while um, that are, I would think they would be like more recognizable as like, oh, like that looks like some of the stuff that I've done previous, but but definitely yeah. maybe um, dosed with some LST. <laughs> it's, pretty, <laughs> it's pretty strange. Um, but, but I have no plans of like sticking with one or the other. It's just like right now I'm obsessed with it and it's doing really well and it's, um, yeah, it's been really crazy, you know, like, uh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, the, every artist, musician, whatever, we all have different muses. Things will get turned on by at different times and oftentimes intensely. You know, we have these like passionate love affairs with like a, a something specific. Yeah. And then get into it and figure out ways that kind of maybe it seeps itself into our work, you know. I don't want to hear as much as I love the first Circa record. I don't really need to hear your next record sounding the same, like, especially exactly. whatever years later, like naturally people progress, get influenced by other stuff, like whether that's music, art, whatever. And like, if right now that's the thing that's turning you on, that's what's turning you on. You know, it's like, that's just, yep. That, that's just the way it is, you know? And, and you'd kind of like mentioned to me um, that you were, debating or thinking about doing some pieces potentially on ethereum mm -hmm. again um well I actually just did i did just one did. okay I what did. so yeah. what made you you know as like i so said with the ethereum thing like it kind of touched a little bit you know at least for me but there's so many reasons i would love to be able to like do stuff on ethereum but uh, priced priced out but you're you're dealing in a different level of um like when I bought pieces in Ethereum or there, there does, when it's, I don't know, you know, like when it's an artist that I know or something, I feel like there's this, it's more real. I don't, I, I know this sounds crazy, but there's something about it. Like the cost of it in a weird way, it seems almost like it's justifying, like it's another level of authentic. You're talking like prestige kind of yeah it, which doesn't really like legitimately make any sense but i'm just talking like emotionally um yeah for some reason i get that feeling and like there, whatever there's a ton of garbage on all the platforms uh, about different yes. stuff. but i'm talking about like if i was buying your piece and in a weird way it cost me 50 dollars to mint it and i was already spending you know just picking an arbitrary number but i'm, I'm spending a thousand dollars right in a weird way, it almost feels emotionally like a rite of passage currently, right. which is crazy. Um, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, but it feels like a more uh, like this authentic, like piece of art. I, I don't like I said, I don't know how to explain it because it, it, there's no logical sense to it outside of emotional um, that, that sure. I have in that sense. But like, what would make you decide to do a piece on ethereum is it because of the people that are collecting comparatively or you know what 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 pushes you so through? it was um it was like a a multi-faceted decision i mean i i have no problems with ethereum um well that's not true i have i have problems with everything <laughs> but <laughs> but uh you know um you know my main reason why I wasn't minting on, on Ethereum is because I, I didn't really, I didn't feel like, yeah, well, I was mostly focused on Hick Hick and Nunk, right? And, and that community there. And, um, and also as I was just basically just experimenting the whole time, it felt more conducive for that. And, um, not just, not just like the atmosphere and the community, but also like financially, like super easy to mint or burn or do whatever. Like, like the cost is so not an issue with Tezos and it's great. Um, that said, you know, like over the last uh, five or six months, um, you know, building up this uh, whole new 
system of collectors and and really feeling like okay this identity is sort of sort of uh you know consolidating like i feel like adhd is a great container for like my my digitally native like crypto native work and like um feeling more confident like i know what it is and then there is this platform super rare which is pretty pretty difficult to to get onto um and that's ethereum and, based or yeah it's okay. ethereum based um and it's always been a goal to get on there um i mean there's just a really high level of digital artists on there um and a whole new world of collectors on there um so really it's about exposure it's about like um finding finding new collectors and also i think sadly i mean there's still these um kind of like there's like a tier system still you know kind of like what you just expressed you know like i don't agree with that but a lot of other people see that and and feel that right uh a lot of people are biased towards ethereum when right. it comes to fine art right so um maybe because it's just been around a little bit longer maybe because the auction houses are using it maybe because you know most of the the massive artists um that have come into NF nfts and the really serious ones who have worked with museums and galleries are working on ethereum that's changing a lot um there's some really massive stuff starting to happen on tezos which is super exciting but for me because i don't feel um any type of like major moral dilemma with working with ethereum um you know for me working like making a piece on ethereum is the equivalent of me going to the gas station <laughs> like okay i don't i don't love it I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't love, I don't love purchasing gasoline, you know, uh, well, at Pennsylvania, Texaco. you don't have to pump your own. So let's just be <laughs> <it's not bad. laughs> some places you do, <laughs> some places you do, uh, it changes depending on where you're at in the state. But like, um, but yeah, like, like I don't love supporting big oil. I don't love right. supporting, you know, Texaco or whatever, but like, it's one of the products of our existence. You know, if you're going to use a car, um, it's, it's difficult not to get sucked up into that system and participate in it. So I see Ethereum as being very similar to that in that there are aspects of it. I don't like that it's energy, um, you know, uh, what's the word? Um, I don't, I don't love that. Uh, it's not super conservative with it, with its energy use. I don't, I don't love that about it, but I, I do love that. Um, the people, the the devs at Ethereum are extremely dedicated for like the long haul. Right. And I actually do, I know it's sort of like a, a meme, this whole ETH2 thing, you know, it's never coming and all this stuff. But actually, if you if you talk to ETH devs, devs and people who are genuinely like in that whole world, it's totally coming and it's coming this year. And um, they're, they're not calling it ETH2 anymore, but... But basically, um, the shift to proof of stake has already occurred. It's already started. Um, yeah, was well, it the, they, the they, beacon chain or um, or whatever? But yeah. it's like you know, I I can see some people, whatever. There's a, a side for every argument, and I personally like I believe that Ethereum is going to make all the changes that I would like to see. But you know, it'd be like, well, there's a motivation for the miners, right? Because they're making a crap ton of money right now. So why sure. would they switch it over? You know. I'm I'm just saying one side of argument, not one I agree with. But what I was what I was kind of saying with like, I don't like I don't have an issue with buying a, a, an NFT on on any of the platforms. But in a weird way, like Super Rare uses Ethereum, and part of like they're a curated high art collection, right? So even them mm -hmm. working on Ethereum, you know, can have a little bit. That's where the I feel like some of the, the higher collectors are on Ethereum. Like, I don't mean to say that like one has more value than the other necessarily, but there, there is this weird association currently a little bit. I don't know if that'll change or what'll happen if yeah. gas fees I think drop, it will. you know? Yeah. Um, I think it will. Um, I, I, 
I do think it's ch- it's changing every day. I see the stigma changing, um, but mostly that that has to do with with major artists coming to Tezos and big um, sort of artistic institutions um, doing things on Tezos. And I long term, I'm I'm more bullish on Tezos, <laughs> um, to be honest. Um, not not because of the energy stuff, because I I honestly do believe. ETH is going to be in a very similar place energy wise very soon. Um, but I think because of the community aspect, because of um, the types of artists that are that are going over to Tezos right now and the infrastructure that is getting built by the fine art world over there, um, I don't know. It's going to get really interesting. Um, but yeah, so for me, it was mostly about you know, like I would never be minting the volume of stuff that I've done on Tezos on Ethereum, not okay. just because of price stuff, but because for me, like, it's kind of like, uh, I mean, this is so weird because in some aspects, like I totally disagree and don't see any of like the the major differences that, that other people see, but in some ways, it does feel like I started a little hardcore band and <laughs> g- g- got a bunch of fans, you know, did an indie deal. And then I just like signed to a major, you know, right, and right. put out a single. Um, <laughs> and I guess to some, to some degree, like that's kind of why I did it. Like I wanted to um, broaden, you know, uh, my collectors, uh, like have, have more uh, access to different collectors, but I've already, because of that one piece that I put on Super Rare, have had a ton of more interest in my Tezos work and then have actually brought collectors who were focused on Ethereum come over to Tezos and and collect some stuff. So I feel like it was worth it. And it was like, again, another experiment. Um, I'm seeing it as, uh, yeah, it's just like a strategic artistic decision really my hope is that it gets more to a point in terms of like ease of use i think there's a lot of issues with ease of use for your average consumer you know but even having to have like different wallets and different things for if you're going to be buying and collecting tezos nfts or polygon you know these different ones um that it can definitely have some onboarding challenges you know for oh yeah uh, and it's going to be like that for a bit yeah and so I hope it, it does kind of get to that point soon. Um, and I know <laughs> um, I don't want to take up like too much your your time here um, and, and just appreciate with, with NFTs like it to kind of wrap up. I mean, because I know for you, it's clear like the value. To me, I personally, you know, it's opinion, find so much value in what's going on, especially in, with independent artists and, and the I think the value and the power that it can give to independent artists is fucking fantastic. Like, um, yeah. and I don't see most of the stuff that people bitch about. I just feel like we don't really go on a day to day basis. I'm putting myself somewhat in with you. We don't really exist in that world, you know, like, uh, on a, like it's which world specifically like the world of just, I don't, I don't know. Like the tech right, bro or, stuff or tech bro, what? but even like over consumerism stuff, like, you know, the, okay. collection, you know, the, the kind of like the collections degenerate, you know, they're like copycat stuff, the whatever, like, I just, I don't exist in that world on a, on like in a regular day to day. It just literally isn't part of my world in any capacity. Um, so I don't yeah. really pay that much mind. I think that's it. the main, that's the main, um, source of confusion i think is like this conflation of like collectibles with fine art um and it's just i mean part of it is why existing in this space is so fun and interesting right now because it's (laughs) so chaotic and crazy um but you know when people when people's entry point to NFTs is hearing about bored apes on Jimmy Fallon, I mean, there's just going to be problems, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, but that's okay. You know, like 
it's like uh, a lot of people are judging NFTs for that type of stuff, which I think is completely understandable. It's there, there is some absolutely ridiculous aspects of NFT and like NFT culture, mm -hmm. which are all like ripe and fair to make fun of and or be completely mind fucked over. Um, but with all that said, I think there is certainly a revolutionary aspect to them as a mechanism for artists getting paid. Um, one thing we haven't even talked about is the fact that secondary royalties are a thing like, oh, shit. Yeah. for life, for well, life. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, like, it's not where I would want it to be personally, like, but it seems to be working that way because there's still ways to break it, you know, do and such like that. But in conceptually and what people are actively working on, I think is, is amazing. It's not where I like, I, you know, I don't think it's where it ultimately needs to be, but in it, it's kind of working in that way, or even the base concept of that out of the gate on secondary markets, I think is right. Is great, you know, and is going yeah. in the right direction. Absolutely. Oh yeah. There are ways to break it. You're right. I mean, um, but for the most part, I would say like the majority of secondary activity uh, does produce a, a, ro a royalty for the original artist. Right. Um, at, with the exception of yes, there are things like if they're brought out of like kind of like their native environment into another platform, you know, OpenSea is kind of like a major offender in this way, in which like a lot of things that wind up on OpenSea don't generate the secondary royalty for the artist because say, you know, it was minted on Super Rare or it was minted right. or wherever. Um, but there have been um a lot of changes in that regard in which like Platforms like Super Rare are allowing artists to create their own contract now so that basically if it goes anywhere outside of Super Rare, it'll always maintain that same royalty rate and it, it, it you know, it'll be built in. Um, Have you looked into the Royal Registry, like what people are doing with that? It's no. basically an attempt. And I think some of these extensions and things putting into smart contracts are trying to basically make this like Royal Registry that's that's accepted and a bunch of platforms have accepted it um oh yeah, yeah OpenSea yeah. has not yet um but there is like a proposal out that basically is saying like yeah it it should continue along but at the same point if i'm buying and this is no offense to you but if i'm buying your one of your nfts uh, me and i'm buying an indie artist i might not be as highly motivated to try and break the royalty chain because i also right. respect you know the idea of the royalty if i'm a flipper buying a board ape or whatever insert yeah. x thing i and it's selling for four hundred thousand dollars and i don't really give a shit about anything i'm pretty highly motivated right. to save 40 you know i mean i i think they're two and a half percent whatever they are i'm pretty yeah, highly yeah. motivated to save like 20 whatever thousand dollars so sure i think within within our world that we probably are generally working at it i think more people are supportive of the idea of royalties but in that, like, whatever, the crazy blown out area, there's a good motivation to go break that chain, you know, potentially. Yeah. I mean, we can still basically put it up against the however many year history of fine art. Yeah. yeah. Let, let, <laughs> how, how many artists have gotten a royalty when their piece sells at auction? You know, I Never. mean, it's yeah. probably like, you know, 0.5%. Um, so, you know, in that sense, shifting it to 70% now or something like that um, it is absolutely crazy. Um, huge deal. Um, so there's that aspect of it. But then I think um, like we touched upon, you know, digital creators who have like almost never been compensated are finally finding a way to do that. And then if we get into it, like just philosophically, um, you know, I find it really interesting the fact that most of us are existing in digital screens all the time. And I spend, you know, a decent amount of time looking at the wallpaper on my desktop more so than I do looking at my walls in my house. So the idea that something that I collect and can view there um, is just as, you know, valuable as something that I would view here makes perfect sense to me. Right. So 
And I think that that's only going to become more and more obvious as time goes on and we spend more and more time in these spaces. So, yeah. I yeah. Know. I mean, it's, if you it's have a background, if you have a background in collecting too, I mean, I grew up on baseball cards, collecting, you know, people collect vinyl. Like, there's already this kind of, they maybe kind of understand a little bit more. I think most people maybe collect or have experience with something, but I would say somebody in Tezos, I think is a really good early entry way with some of the pricing, like, if you understand enough, some crypto, get some, check it out. Like, I feel like the experience of actually buying one and owning one, like does going through having that firsthand experience changes things. I mean, that's opinion. Um, yes, but I, for I think sure. it's really valuable and you can get in. There's a very low entry way for some stuff. Um, so I would definitely suggest people look into it. You know, there are easy ways to do it. There's other like cheaper options. There's a ton of different blockchains to check out and different things. Um, but for a couple bucks, you can find out, see what the experience is like. And for sure. I mean, to, yeah, I completely echo that sentiment and like, you know, to appeal to people who, uh, love to support artists, you can, you know, check that box of patronage, like big time, especially if you go over to Tezos, which is like, you know, go to object.com, um, O B J K T.com. And you could support any amount of small artists for like less than $10 literally. Yeah. Um, and so you'll get that. All right. Direct patronage to artist check. Uh, <laughs> you'll, you'll have this thing that you get to look at at any point and you know, like, okay, I bought that from this artist. I supported them. And now I have this thing. There are people making money in a way that is not a Ponzi scheme. They're like <laughs> legitimately yeah. collecting from artists, getting a thing, and then someone else wants to collect that, they buy it from it. It's the same as any other collectible market. And um, it's absolutely fascinating. It's absolutely addictive and uh, it's thriving. So I would definitely recommend anyone who's interested, just give it a shot. There's I don't know. Be careful. Obviously, do your own research, but yeah, I think it's fun. Yeah. Well, Con, I I can't tell you how much I appreciate just in, in general, like catching up, like I said, I, um, and and talking about this stuff, and, and I always have really enjoyed talking to you about art in whatever sense over the past however many years. Um, yeah, and, and really value your your friendship and and being able to chat like this. So. I feel the same way, brother. And I mean, like, I'm totally in awe of what you built over the years. It's crazy. You know, like, you know, you started something so like small and humble and just like this thing that was a passion project. And now you've created a fucking empire. So it's nuts. It's, uh, it's been an, it's been amazing and inspiring thing to witness. And uh, I'm always here cheering you on. Awesome, man. So, Con, I appreciate yeah. it so much. And I'll put links to uh, everything. Is there anything you need to shout out for people to, to check you out on? Um, I'll I'll just do my uh, duty and say <laughs> that my band just put out uh, – uh, we put out two EPs in the last couple months. Um, and, uh, well, I guess the second one is pre-order. I don't know when this will actually come out. It's probably out. It's probably out if you're watching this. Uh <laughs> So it's a dream about love and a dream about death. Um, and uh, there's music out there and stuff, but you know. Awesome. Whatever, well, I'll make sure I'll put all the links to all the stuff that you want down in the, in the description. And again, I appreciate it so much, Colin. Thank you. Love you, buddy. All right. Love you too. Later. Creative Labs by Alchemy with your host, Greg Kerr. Are you interested in making enamel pins, washi tape, patches, acrylic keychains, and more? Get in touch and create with us at alchemymerch.com.